like to use this unique opportunity because if such a panel, maybe with different moderator, but such a panel will happen in New York, Washington, or London, it will be big queue of politicians, media experts to try to get into the room. Uh, I want to use this unique opportunity and to ask our top experts where we are in one year in three different areas and during five minutes each of you will have a chance to give your view to try your capacity as, as a prophet. And uh, my uh, three questions, where we are in one year? First, it's about domestic political situation in the United States. Uh, second, about Brexit and the United, and the United Kingdom. And third, about a relationship between West and Russian Federation, including sanctions. Please, each of you, you have five minutes. And please, Farid, please, you are first. Hello, hello. Is this, are these working? Yeah. Um, thank you, Victor. As always, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, there's a very big, broad question, so let me try to be very uh, brief and uh, not beat around the bush and say something specific about each one. On the United States, the domestic political situation, look, there are three aspects to the Trump presidency. The first is the circus of Donald Trump. That is the tweets, the crazy you know, comments, the media going crazy about him. That's entertainment, and that continues in full force. The second is the legal issues surrounding the Trump presidency, the investigation, um, and that seems to be heating up. And that seems particularly in the last two or three weeks to have gotten more intense, which will raise the stakes for both President Trump and the Democrats. I'd say that at the beginning of the last year, you know, a year ago, I would have put the chance of impeachment at 5%. I would say it's probably now more like 15 or 20%. I still think it is unlikely, in fact, highly unlikely, but the fact that you have all these people cooperating with, uh, with Robert Mueller does raise the stakes, and this will raise the stakes for Donald Trump. He has already, as you can see, nationalized the election, the midterm election, around two issues immigration and impeachment. His argument to his voters is you need to come out and vote because otherwise the Democrats will let everybody in uh, and they will undo a, a, a legitimate election. And these are both very powerful persuasive tactics. Trump has very good political instincts. Um, he's very, I think he has a good feel particularly for how to bring out his base. Um, it's important to point out that there is another element of the Trump presidency which is doing better than most people believe, which is the policy side. If you are a conservative Republican, Donald Trump has passed a huge tax cut, enacted huge deregulation, uh, managed to appoint conservative justices up and down the, the courts of the United States, um, and is becoming more assertive in a whole series of areas but, you know, relating to uh, 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 law and order issues that conservatives like. So he has been more successful in those areas by his own standards than people want to admit. Your final question on Russia. I believe that policy on Russia in the United States is essentially paralyzed because Donald Trump may have certain instincts on Russia which he reveals by the way he speaks about Russia and Putin. Remember, Donald Trump is sort of, he, he's like a guy from Queens, which is one of the outer boroughs of New York, who doesn't like foreigners. This is his foreign policy. To the extent he has a foreign policy, he just thinks foreigners are bad. 
They are always taking advantage of Americans, and that's true of the Europeans, the Japanese. He even fight, has managed to pick fights with Canadians, which you might think is almost impossible, because the Canadians are so inoffensive that you can't imagine how anyone could find something to fight with them about. But he's managed it, with the exception of one country, Russia. He never says a bad word about Russia. He never says a bad word about Putin. Uh, we all know what the speculation is. But the truth is that the American system, House Republicans, House Democrats, uh, the, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, do not agree with him and have maintained a fairly tough policy on Russia. But it's somewhat paralyzed, I say, because neither side can do anything particularly dramatic because it would upset the apple cart. And so Trump allows those guys to inch forward on some incremental tough sanctions on, on Russia, and yet he doesn't do any kind of bold new overture. The main shift in Russia policy is that Donald Trump had a two-hour conversation with Vladimir Putin. And while I think for all of us, the entertainment value alone of understanding what was said at that, in that uh, conversation would be great, nothing has come of it so far. So as far as I can tell, as I say, policy on Russia is simply paralyzed. Thank you. And your opinion uh, from point of view of sanctions, uh, increasing, lifting, the same? So on sanctions, my sense is that this is Putin's number one priority with Trump. I, if I were to guess what happened in that conversation in Helsinki, Putin talked to Trump about sanctions. Um, I, I saw this myself. I was in St. Petersburg when I was interviewing uh, Putin, uh, and we had, a, we had a, a meeting in the green room before with Putin, Nazarbayev, Renzi of Italy, and I was sitting there. And for the entire 40 minutes, usually in these green room conversations, it's all small talk, you know, chit chat. The entire 40 minutes, Putin talked to Renzi about sanctions and about why the Europeans, why the Italians should break with Europe and end the sanctions. And he kept pointing to me and saying, you're paying for the Americans' uh, foreign policy. You don't get anything out of it. America doesn't trade with Russia. You're paying for their foreign policy. So he's very determined on that front. I think that is the, the, the weak link, by the way. It's not the United States. It's Italy. It has been very difficult to renew European sanctions. Uh, Salvini has already said he might, if Italy breaks, Trump will most certainly support that. So I, I think there is mo a greater danger that the whole sanctions regime against Russia will collapse because the Europeans will start to dissent. Thank you, Farid. And Julian, uh, the same three topics, U.S. domestic political situation in, in one year, Brexit and West Russian Federation. Well, I should say, first of all, thank you very much indeed, Victor, for this fascinating um, event. Um, I would echo almost everything that my colleague Fareed has said. So I won't repeat what he said. Um, I would like to cast it forward in a bigger question about what's happening, because what links Brexit, what links the US political, political situation, what links relationships between Russia and the US is a growing sense of poison in global affairs. And I think there are three numbers that everyone should be watching right now to see how much more poisonous this becomes. The first number is 35. And that is the proportion of the developed country vote which has gone to populist candidates in recent elections. According to calculations by Bridgewater, the hedge fund, it's gone up from 5% at the beginning of 2010 to 35%. And the only time you've ever seen a swing this big is in the 1930s, just before World War II. So the first point is that the West is becoming increasingly populist across the electoral system, and that is poisoning this international relations. Second number briefly is 10 trillion. That very broadly is the estimate of the amount of quantitative easing that is now being withdrawn from the global economy and that's putting pressure or going to put pressure on financial markets. 
Um, and that's, again, a very, very important signal. And the last one is 217%. That's the amount of global debt to GDP that's in the system. And when you take the amount of debt that's out in the system, when you take the amount of central bank support being withdrawn and the rising levels of populism, the way to understand what's happening in the US political sphere and Brexit and US-Russian relations is an increasing sense of pressure, of anger against the system, increasing political and economic fragilities. So on the US, I think the political climate will be more poisonous in a year's time, because I think that unless Trump is impeached, which I agree with Fareed is unlikely, the, he will remain in place. He will be supported very strongly by some of the voters, hated by others. On Brexit, I think that, that the UK will stagger to some kind of last minute deal compromise, but it will be very last minute and it won't please anybody. More poison there. And on US-Russian relations, I do not see any chance of an improvement anytime soon while you have this growing sense of poison in the, in the global financial system and the, global, and the political system too in the West. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank you. Uh, Richard, please. And I know that two of you, you are really in a hurry because okay. in, in, will, uh, in 10 minutes you have to leave for your planes. I'll, s I'll spend the most of my time on the U.S., so let me quickly address first Brexit and Russia. On Brexit, I tend to agree with Gillian. I think you will have a deal. Uh, I think it'll be a very vague deal. And it'll be the equivalent of a, a divorce, but all the question about how to separate the property and who's going to take care of the kids is going to be decided down the road. So this will be a, a surface agreement for Brexit and the details to, to come. I'd love there to be a second referendum. I find it insane that there is not a second referendum that actually votes on the details of an agreement. But at the moment, I don't see there being a second referendum. And worse yet, traditional politics don't resolve this simply because the Labour Party as well as the Conservative Party are both at the moment headed by individuals who one way or another are sympathetic to Brexit or at least not sympathetic to remain or doing anything about it. So it'd be a fundamentally different situation if the Labour Party were headed by somebody who was pro-remain and the problem is you don't have that. Uh, with Russia, the relationship's not going to go anywhere for reasons I discussed in the previous panel. I think the real question, by the way, which we haven't talked about here, it came up yesterday a little bit with China, with Neil Ferguson, about China's brittleness. I would simply want to suggest that Russia's brittleness should not be underestimated. Mr. Putin does not have a domestic economic or political policy. He ha what will happen the day after he is no longer leading Russia? How will you have a legitimate succession when there is no legitimacy any longer in the Russian political system? His successor, if there is a clear one, will not inherit a functioning economy, will not inherit a functioning political system. I think we, are not, we need to look at the long-term question mark over Russia. Last, my own country. Midterm elections, probably the Democrats do pretty well, gain control of the House. Republicans probably keep the Senate, but who knows. I think we have to assume that Mr. Trump will be the president for the next two plus years. Anyone who has an idea about the 2020 presidential election, I would not listen to. It's too soon. I think, though, and it gets a little bit of what Jillian was getting at and Fareed mentioned, there's certain realities, though, that won't change. America was and is, in many ways, politically dysfunctional in ways that have nothing to do with Donald Trump. Washington wasn't working and isn't working uh, now. We are, we are accumulating debt at the rate of over a trillion dollars a year. A trillion dollars a year. The debt to GDP ratio now, we're, we're, we're in uncharted waters. And what matters so much is the United States is not just another country. We're the world's largest of the country and the dollar plays this global role. Is this sustainable? The answer is yes, until the day it's not. And that's when it will become unsustainable. And at the moment, I don't see any appetite for dealing with this. There's no serious conversation in the country 
about what to do about new technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics, driverless vehicles that are eliminating or will eliminate millions of existing jobs. Meanwhile, we probably have six or seven million jobs in the United States that are going unfilled because of the enormous gap between what the jobs require and the skills in the workforce. And our public and private education system is unable to close that gap. That's a real crisis that's coming. We're not talking uh, about it. I could go on, but I would simply say there's a growing mismatch between the scale of some of our problems and the ability of our political system to grapple with those problems. Donald Trump is not the cause of that gap or mismatch. He strengthens it, he increases it, he reflects it. But even after Donald Trump passes from the political scene, I think the real question facing my country is whether we can deal with these underlying challenges. Thank you, Richard. And Stephen, please. To Thank you, Victor. Yet again, I've made the massive schoolboy error of sitting at the wrong end of the panel. So I spend 15 minutes listening to all this wise, learned thought from my lovely colleagues, and then I'm landed with the idea of saying something different and new, uh, which is not terribly easy. So I'm going to be a little bit brief. Uh, I'm going to try and throw out a few ideas that are quite specific and may be completely wrong, but it doesn't matter because you'll have forgotten by next year, so I don't really mind too much. Um, but uh, I'll take it in the order Victor gave us the, the challenges. I'll start with the United States. Uh, I witnessed the fascinating moment when Larry Summers put a wager uh, on Trump's future together with Neil Ferguson. Larry was saying Trump will not make it through his four-year term. Neil Ferguson was absolutely convinced that he would. The odds were given as seven to one. So if Trump doesn't make it, Larry Summers gets $700. If Trump makes a full term, uh, Neil Ferguson gets 100. I actually right now would rather be on Larry Summers' end of that deal, uh, partly because I'm a gambler, so I'd like to make the big bucks, but partly because I, I actually think Robert Mueller is a, a very, very serious guy, and he has clearly tapped into a vein of damning uh, investigation, which Donald Trump also very clearly is extraordinarily worried about. And Paul Manafort's just been flipped. I've lost count of how many people have been flipped. I don't know whether it'll ultimately amount to high crimes and misdemeanors, but I do know that if the midterms do uh, produce this uh, democratic wave, a lot of Republicans will have to think very hard about where they stand on this. And I, Fareed, I think, said, what, 10, 15, or maybe even 20% likelihood of, an, of, of Trump not getting through the term. I, I just have an instinctive feeling the possibility is a little bit higher than that, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say we may not see this Trump administration last the full four years, this Trump presidency. So with that in mind, I also have just been thinking about what that will mean for American politics. Yes, it's going to be horrible. It's going to be toxic. It's going to be so deeply polarized. Uh, the Democratic Party is going to have a, a really interesting choice to make about who it puts up next time around. Uh, I don't think the left alternatives, whether it's old school uh, Bernie Sanders or uh, a, a, a different left voice, Elizabeth Warren or anybody like that, I don't think that's going to be their answer. I am absolutely fascinated by the guy I've been watching in Texas running uh, a very impressive Democratic can campaign in Republican territory, a guy called Beto O'Rourke that I'd never heard of before. Uh, so if I give you one tip for a US politician to look out for over the next year, it would be him. I think he's really exciting and really talented. Um, so that's me on America, a year of very great turbulence in the US. Brexit, I think, uh, there will be a fudge, so I'm agreeing with everybody else. I think Theresa May is politically finished. I, I, I think, and I was going to say I fear, but I'm trying to be as neutral as possible, that uh, next year when we meet Boris Johnson, maybe the Prime Minister of Great Britain, not a prospect that I'm looking forward to with huge amounts of enthusiasm, but nonetheless, one has to be realistic about the way politics is right now. Uh, and I think 
ultimately the deal between Britain and the European Union will be a sort of Canada, enhanced Canada free trade deal. And I think nobody will much like it, but it's probably the best that one can hope for right now. I think the plan, the rather more deeper pl uh, relationship plan that Theresa May has is also politically, just as politically finished as she is, frankly. Uh, so that's my, my prediction. I think the UK then faces a, a very hard period of, of economic travail, polarized politics, and deep internal discontent. So that's something to look forward to, isn't it? Um, and then finally on uh, Russia, uh, I'm very struck by what I heard from Bill Ford, the one place in the entire world that he and wise investors will not put any money is Russia. I think the Russian economy is extraordinarily fragile and brittle. Putin knows it. Putin is desperately trying to drive wedges between the United States and Europe. I just came last week from an interview with Salvini in Italy. Uh, he admires Vladimir Putin. So do many other populist and far-right leaders in Europe. I think there is going to be a real question about how much persistence Europe has with uh, sanctions. The Germans are very unhappy with the Americans. There's the whole Nord Stream pipeline deal that is driving new wedges between partners. So. I think Putin's going to try very hard to break the sanctions uh, dam. I'm not sure he'll succeed, but I think the bigger and more interesting thing in Russia is just how dangerously brittle their economy is. And the other thing I'd say about Russia is that I believe that Alexei Navalny is actually a real threat to Vladimir Putin. I take him seriously, and I would watch that space because I think there is still scope, despite all of the repression and the media control, there is scope for opposition inside Putin to grow and to grow quite quickly. Uh, so again, I guess on all three fronts, US, UK, Europe, and Russia, uh, and its relations with Europe and the wider world, I'm pl pretty bleak. I foresee a lot of turbulence. The one thing I can predict with absolute certainty is that despite Yulia Tymoshenko's semi-offer to me, I will not, this time next year, appear at this conference as Ukraine's foreign minister. I, 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 I promise you that okay. whatever offers I am presented with, that okay. ain't going to happen. Uh, okay. Victor, back to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, dear friends, thank you very much. I think great panel. In one year, we will be able, I'm sure, we will have a chance to check your quality as prophets. And, uh, Thank you very much. Dear friends, I want to say that Julian and Richard, they're really in a hurry. They have to leave our conferences. And Far Farid and uh, Stephen still will stay with us until the end of the day. And now just let's say to them, thank you very, very much.